Okay, so um, maybe, maybe we just touch on a little bit um, from last week. I don't know how many guys got the chance to listen to last week's sermon. Some people feel like it was a little bit different to what we normally hear. Yeah, but um, I really felt that we can't approach our faith and um, our role in, in the world and even the church. We can't approach it casually uh, you know, anymore. We have to wake up. As a church, we have to, Peter um, wrote and he said, hey, you must be sober-minded. Paul wrote and says, do not conform to this world. So there has to be a, an alertness. We have to really approach things like in, and be completely present and intentional with the way we uh, live out and express our faith. We can't be casual. Uh, so uh, last week, just a little bit of recap, we just spoke about everybody's probably aware of all the political things going on around the world, um, yeah, um, and and just how politics is really failing, and uh, you can you can see two things. You know, there's like a there's a um, a cycle, a that happens and reoccurs and reoccurs. You read it from from uh, the beginning in the times of Genesis. You you. You see how the enemy comes after kids all the time. The enemy comes after kids. But at the same time, like the scripture says, when the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit will raise a standard against it. And so often we can get distracted with what the enemy is doing, that we, we miss what God is actually doing. And so um, when, when you hear stuff like... Uh, like what's going on with with the Bella Bill. And I just thought just from uh it's we have to be able to voice things and say like we oppose it, you know. We are we're against it. We're anti what what the government is 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 introducing into our country and we have to stand up against these things. Come on. And so it's a good day. We're, the, as fathers we need to know and mothers we need to know what's coming against our kids and we need to we need to defend. We need to stand. But um, yes, uh, there's a quote that we used to have in the back there that said, Jesus did not live in reaction to the devil. He lived in response to the Father. So to not just react to what the enemy is doing. Okay, what is God doing? You know, do you know what the Lord is doing? And, and I think in our time, we also have to realize that if there is a tax coming on, and listen, it's not just coming on our kids. It's coming, I, I, don't, I can't think of a faith that is more persecuted than Christianity. I just shared something that blessed me so much. It's like, uh, it's almost like that image of that big golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar said, you will bow and you must worship. And if you don't, you know, and that's the message that's going on around the world. If you don't bow, you know, you're canceled or you'll go to jail or whatever. But, but we love people. We love all people. And uh, I don't have to agree with you in order to love you. You know, I can disagree with you and I can love you still. There's a, there's a nice balance there. But anyway, let's get back to what God is doing. Amen. God is moving around the world. God is with us. God is moving in the, in the Word Church. God is doing great stuff here. So I want you to, let's open in the Beninging, in Genesis, in the Beninging. Genesis chapter 11. Okay, and we're going to read from verse 1. Again, I'm so thankful to hear pages. Whoosh, 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 I love it. I love the sound of it. So verse 1 says, The whole earth had a common language and a common vocabulary. When the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Then they said to one another, Come, 
Let's make bricks, bake them thoroughly. They had brick instead of stone and tar instead of mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered across the face of the entire earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people had started building. And the Lord said, if as one people all sharing a common language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be beyond them. Um, who's in the back there, Donata, can you quickly put that in the King James verse 6? Just want to show you what the King James Bible says. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That's something really, that's a massive compliment from God, right? Verse 7, back to the net translation, says, Come, let's go down and confuse their language so that they won't be able to understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there across the face of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. Now, it's amazing that God had to literally come down, confuse everybody, give them a different language. Because while they were all in one accord or in one language, God said, yeah, these guys are united. Nothing is going to be impossible. Let's confuse them. You know, let's confuse them. So uh, then immediately they, they didn't understand one another. Um, let's quickly go all the way to the New Testament and uh, go to Acts chapter 2. And you can see literally almost the opposite happening. Anya and I were talking about a quote that we saw um, that in a business. Let me just hope, hopefully quote it correctly. It says something like, the success of a business is not the result of being established for a long time. It's because of people that are speaking it, dreaming it, everything. Oh, I suppose eating, whatever, doesn't work, but just everything about that. They are running that business because every, everybody believes. Everybody is invested in it. And that's what happened in, in Genesis 11. Now we have something similar happening in Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all to together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven, filled the entire house where they were sitting, and tongues spreading out like a fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven residing in Jerusalem. When this sound occurred, a crowd gathered, and they were in confusion because each one heard them speaking his own language. So now in the, in the old, God comes and he confuses everybody. He says, because they were building a city. They were building towers. He said, hey, nothing will be impossible. In the new, all of them are gathered in one accord, same story, and God comes and he, he uh, gives the Holy Spirit. These guys all start speaking in different tongues, and the whole city comes together, and they all hear them speaking in their own language. Come on, it's really interesting. So, so, so God has got this agenda. He actually wants to unite the people. He wants to bring people into, into one, one accord, and he actually says, here's the language that you're going to speak. We're going to speak in spirit. Okay? 
and, and for the purpose of bringing the church into unity. Yeah, man, this is good. This is good. So all of them, uh, can you imagine what it was like when that happened? I, I've, I don't know how many of you have, have um, I remember in Mozambique, I can tell you so many stories. We, we went to Mozambique and we, uh, we would evangelize the people there. And I remember one day I was just getting tired of working with a, with a translator, interpreter. And uh, I, I just went, we were at a hospital and uh, we were going so slowly. I felt, man, there has to be a different, a different way. And uh, so I moved and I went into the ward and I, I saw the guy sitting, one of the guys sitting there that was sick, and I, I went like this, and he went, he waved back, because he can't speak English, couldn't speak English, couldn't speak a word of English. And um, so I said, my name is Bruce, you know? I don't know how many guys saw Mind Your Language. Do you guys remember that? It's almost like, por favor, I am Bruce. <laughs> or blind me. <laughs> What's... I don't know if you watched that story. We watched it the other day. I was enjoying it. And, uh, but I, I couldn't communicate with this guy. Anyway, so the in, interpreter eventually came, and I just said, let me just find a way. And I started I pray, praying in the Spirit. When I prayed in the Spirit, apparently I called this guy by his name. You know? And that's what happens. Sometimes uh, we believe in the, in the praying of tongues, in praying in tongues, but... Sometimes uh, I've heard stories where people just pray in the Spirit, and it's not that you're praying in Tswana or in French. It's that people hear it. The people hear it in their own language. They hear it in their own dialect. Anyway, and, and so it brings unity. So th that's one of the signs that happens, all right? So now let's... Um, where were we reading? Verse 11, I think. Verse 6. Okay, let's read through. Verse 7. Completely baffled, they said, aren't all these who are, who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? Let's just skip all those towns and let's go to verse 14. Peter stood up with, eleven, with the eleven ra and raised his voice. You men of Judea, all you who live in Jerusalem, know this and listen carefully to what I say. In spite of what you think, these men are not drunk. I, I want to say something about this. You know, I don't like... I don't like the comparison that we have in the spirit where people compare drunk people to people who are filled. I don't know why it's quite popular. I don't know if you've seen it a lot. If you've come from a reserve background, you may never have been introduced to this. But a lot of times people will say, hey, you know, I'm drunk in the spirit. I can't find something like that in scriptures. So I don't like the word drunk. You know, I don't like that. The scripture says, do not be drunk <laughs> with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Yeah, when, you, you, when you're drunk, you do stupid things, <laughs> all right? But when you're filled with the Spirit, I mean, it can come across as drunk. But, but Peter immediately got up and said, they're not drunk, <laughs> okay? Come on, church, please work with me. They're not, they're not drunk. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going somewhere. So, uh, so, verse 16, he says, these guys are not drunk, but this is what was spoken uh, through the prophet Joel, Joel. And in the last days, I will pour on all people, uh, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And it's quite interesting because 
I know they were speaking about tongues there, but Isaiah actually prophesies about tongues. But he was quoting Joel, and Joel, Joel said, hey, in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men, and your, I'm just going to quote it, old and young will see visions and dream dreams. Maybe we tasted a hint of it in COVID, like just an idea of it. You know, maybe just, just to give you an idea of what it could have been like. I mean, at no point did anybody walk into the church, point guns at us and say, hey, you know, are you a Christian? Are you not? We, we have not experienced persecution like that. But what amazes me is that when, whenever the push comes on the faith, people surrender their lives for Jesus. And the result is massive growth. Massive growth. But this is, this is what, was, what was in God's mind, is I want to pour my spirit out on you. You know, and I think as a, we, we're celebrating Father's Day today, but I think every father in this house, if he hears a word that says, I want to pour my spirit on your children. I want your children to, to have, um, to be able to prophesy, to see visions. So last week we dedicated little Myla, and, and uh, I was thinking of just how special and how amazing it is. And you go back to 1 Samuel, and you read the story of Samuel, how Hannah, she was praying and praying for a son. Uh, I don't know if we should read it, but she cried out over and over, God, give me a son, give me a son. Uh, I think the scripture says, that uh, the impression, people didn't realize how, how badly she was just praying and pressing in and pressing. And um, eventually, Eli one day thinks she's drunk because of the way she's praying. He says, he's, Eli tells Hannah, stop drinking, <laughs> mad woman. And she actually says, no, I, I've got this soul, this deep uh, cry out inside of me. It says, Lord, give me a son. And she eventually said, I will, I, will, um, I will dedicate this child if, you will, if you'll give me the child. She, uh, she grows him up until he's like weaned off of her. And then she brings him to the temple. All right. Thank, just thank God that we don't do that. You know, don't bring your children to me to raise. I think you all need, you yeah. know. Raise your own kids. But she, she, she lets um, Samuel, okay, Samuel's born, Samuel's weaned, and then she, she brings him to the, um, to the temple. Maybe let's just read it, chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. I just want you to see that, um, that, that introduction there. Sam, 1 Samuel 3, verse 1 says, now the, the boy Samuel continued serving the Lord under Eli's supervision. Word from the Lord was rare in those days. Revelatory visions were infrequent. And I, um, uh, your translation might say it was precious. Uh, but that means it was precious be because it was really hard to find. Like a, like a diamond is really hard to find. The Word of God was like that in those days. People didn't hear God's voice. People didn't see visions. Uh, people didn't hear, but, but we know what happened with Samuel. So you can read chapter 3, beautiful story. How, um, and it should encourage every parent to, to, to bring your kids to church, to really encourage them in the environment um, of the anointing and when the Lord is moving and doing something. A uh, story has it, Samuel would go sleep next to the Ark of the Covenant. You know, Samuel would sleep there by the Ark. And uh, one night, Samuel hears the voice, Samuel. And uh, Samuel runs to, to, to Eli 
And Eli says, I didn't call you. And, uh, okay, go back to bed, he says. And so Samuel goes back to the ark. Eli is down there. Next thing again, Samuel. And Samuel runs to Eli. Eli says, I didn't call you. Since <laughs> go back to bed. And by the third time, Samuel realizes that the Lord is speaking to this child. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he tells him what to say. And next thing, before you know it, Eli, uh, Samuel and God are in a relationship. And the Bible says that since that young age, you know, the moment that Samuel, God started speaking to Samuel, he says not one prophetic word that Samuel ever gave dropped, dropped to the ground. Was for nothing. Every word that he spoke was fulfilled. Now think about that Old Testament. Think about the New Testament, what God wants to do when he says, hey, I'm going to bring you as um, the church into a time where I'm going to give everybody a language to speak. And, and the result of that language is, your, I'm going to pour my spirit. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. <laughs> your young and old will, will dream dreams and see visions. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm like, I'm, I feel... Uh, again, lined up with last week's message. We need to contend again for that. You know, it's like when we come into, the, into our church and we gather together, we should be anticipating supernatural things. Let me just show you some, some scriptures. Um, chapter 2, towards the end, it speaks about how the church grew daily. Every day, people were added to it. Let's go to chapter 5 of Acts. Chapter 5. Of, of the book of Acts. If you read from verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12, now many miraculous signs and wonders came about among the people through the hands of the apostles. By common consent, they were all meeting together in Solomon's portico. Sounds like a sports car or something like that. But it, it was a, it was a, a place. And just before I carry on reading that, every time God moved, even in the New Testament and the Old, you, you, you see them highlight the place, that there was a place where they met. There was a place where, uh, where people prayed. There was a place where, we, where they worshipped, you know, like we need that place. I, I pray that the word church, this place next to a synagogue will be like that. I, I pray that, that people, let's say our, our children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren <laughs> will speak about what happened at the Word Church at a place where God was moving. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. I'm not of those who preach against the place. I, I love the place. I love a place where we can gather. And... Um, but uh, and so I want to. Uh, it's just a maybe a, just a little warning about people who who preach against. Oh no, we're against the four walls, and you know the time of the four walls are over. No, no, <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. Um, the church must be out there. You know we gotta we gotta get into the streets and into yeah. But you got all the other days to do that. You got the Monday, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to be the church, and you you've got the Sunday where you can where you can come to church. Amen? So at that place, the, the apostles came. But look what happened. By common consent, they were all meeting together. Sorry, verse 13. Um, none of the rest dared to join them, but people held them in high honor. More and more believers in the Lord were added to their number, crowds of both men and women. Okay, the, the King James Version, I think, might say they were added daily. That daily people would come and come and come and come and come. So I want to speak to, to, to the church, to you, about this today. You know, let's, if we just speak, um, what will happen when the church fully invests in what we're reading here? When our lives are invested in the promise. Acts chapter 2, I didn't read it, but Peter got up and he said, the promise of the Holy Spirit is to you 
and to your children. Meaning God is interested in your family. God is interested in your household. God is not just interested in, you know, what happens here. It just needs to go beyond here. It needs to get into your home. You know, what will happen? Come on, moms, dads, everybody that's sitting here. What will happen where we really open our hearts to it, where it's not necessary to have pressure, persecution come over us before we open up to the Spirit of God? Two, three years ago, they said, no, you can't have church. Church is not essential. It, the, the services that, that well, let's call us the resistance, was awesome. We came together and we worshipped. Because there was something about the cost of, oh goodness, I could get into trouble for worshipping, but I can't live without it. I can't live without coming together. Something about that cost pushed us together. We had incredible meetings, you know, like you would watch that back door <laughs> occasionally and think, what will we do? But I know that in every person sitting in this place, if the pressure came on you, I don't think that you would surrender your faith. I think that you would, you would stand up for your faith. But why wait till the pressure is on? Why wait to invest your life into, into what, the, what the Word promises? Why wait for something like that to happen? What if we all just like that, that uh, quote in the beginning where, where we realize that the success of a company is not the result of how long it's been established, but it is people speaking it, dreaming it, applying it, everybody working together. And, and I think I, I, maybe my heart's cry today is to, is to you, you know, I, I had a I met with a, a mom and a dad. I shared this last week in the shops. I invited them to church and it was old school friends of mine. And uh, they said, no, no, they know they've got to come. They know they've got to come. And so I said, why? Why do you? I'm just interested. Why do you say that? They said, no, the kids, the kids need it. I was like, no, you, you need it. You need to come to church. You're the example. You're the example. Come on, someone. Amen? Imagine what's going to happen. Uh, I can't think, okay, and, and again, part of our, our vision here is like everybody, uh, all our leaders will know this. My vision for the church or our vision is not to build a 20,000-seater church. Hey, if we get to build one, fantastic. But I want a people that is full of God. Like there's that one quote that says, some people pray for a, a church full of people. I pray for a people full of God. I want you to hear visions. I want you to, to dream dreams. I want you to be full of, full of Jesus. You know, I don't want, I've said it before, I don't want you to come watch me burn for Jesus. I want you to burn with Jesus. Uh, burn with me for Jesus. I want you to be filled with the Spirit. Come on. And now I'm just thinking, if I look at each one of you, it's impossible, impossible that you don't have a field of influence where you are. You might have come alone today, but around you on a weekly, you meet, we meet so many people. If if and when the church is fully invested in what we do, this place will be too small anyway. You know, imagine, imagine what will happen uh, today. If each person here that came, and maybe some of you are visiting for the first time, and I'm throwing you in deep water, but if each of us, imagine if we had committed to reaching one soul in the week, or one person, or just dragging someone with to church, bribing them, doing something. If we made it our goal to get each one to, to be a part of it, then uh, we double. Like this meeting would be double next week. But this right here, what's happening, should not be our evangelism. This is not where we should evangelize. This is not the field of evangelism. This is where 
us as a church come together. Come on. You are powerful. You are filled with the Spirit. You know, eliminate the excuses. You know, when I, when I look at you, I know I'm, I'm looking at all different kinds of characters. You know, I know some of your language is not so sanctified. And you think, maybe, maybe the Lord can't use me. I need to, I need to sharpen up on my language because it's definitely not tongues. Well, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Lord can help you with that, you know. Here's how it starts. It's not the obligation to, to do anything. It's like, Lord, if I read these words and I, you know, something about hearing that the Lord has a plan for my children touches me. You know, it's like inside of me, it's like, yeah, Lord, that's what I want. I want my kids filled with, with, with him. Well, I'm telling you, that's how he feels about you as well. And we need, to, we need to open our hearts for that, to that. Um, maybe let's, let's close. I don't even know what time we're at. Oh, we're nice and early today. Let's go to, to John. And uh, let's go to John 17. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this whole prayer that Jesus prayed. I'm just going to read it in closing today. A lot of time people say, you know, this is... Um, Let's pray the Lord's Prayer, and they'll quote from, from you know, the Our Father. But that's not the Lord's Prayer, that's the prayer that He taught us to pray. If you're looking for the Lord's Prayer, you'll find it here in John chapter 17. Okay. John 17, verse 1. Let's kind of read it together. Um, you don't, not out loudly, but like if you don't have a Bible in front of you, you can follow with this. And try and listen to each word. Pay attention to each word because Jesus is literally praying for you in this, in this prayer. This is right before he was about to be crucified and uh, he got to pray this. When Jesus had finished these sayings, he looked upward to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Just as you have given him authority over all humanity so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. Verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I had with you before the world was created. I have revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they understand that everything you have given me comes from you. Because I have given them the words you have given me, they accepted them and really understand that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I am praying on behalf of them. I'm not praying on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you have given me because they belong to you. Now, if you hear that, that part, you should know, hey, man, I belong to him. I belong to God. This prayer is not for the whole world. This prayer is for those that belong to him. Everything I have belongs to you, and everything you have belongs to me, and I have been glorified by them. I am no longer 
in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them safe in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. Now, I just want to pause there. That, that is true unity. It's not just unity like in Simon, yeah, we are one. Or is it? It's, it's, it's one. It's, it's one with the Father. It's like God, God, He says where two or three are gathered in my, I'm there. Two or three. So it's not, if here is 50 people and there's two or three that is gathered, He's present. It's, if there's two or three that are one with the Father in that He's present. But you have to see yourself literally, I am one with Jesus. I am one with the Father. It means His desires become my desires. Okay? Verse 12, When I was with them, I kept them safe, watched over them in your name that you have given me. Um, let's go to verse 13. But now I'm coming to you. I'm saying these things in the world so they may experience my joy completed in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. And I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you will keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Set them apart in truth. Your word is truth. And just as, I, as you sent me into the world, so I am sending them into the world. And I set myself apart on their behalf so that they too may truly be set apart. I'm not praying only on their behalf, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony. You see, that's you. That they will all be one, just as you. Just as you, Father, on in me and I in, in you. I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one so that the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they can see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, even if the world does not know you, I know you. And these men know that you sent me. I made known your name to them and I will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me may be with them and I may be in them. That's a prayer that Jesus prayed. You can see right before he died, he said, Lord, Lord I want these people to be one with, with me. I want them to be united with me. I don't want to take them out of the world. I want to send them into the world. You know, I don't want to take them out. I want them to be the salt. I want them to be the light. But in order for that to happen, church, we have to get maybe start with just a little bit of hunger, convert it into more hunger, realize the world is dependent on it. It's the only real anchor that we have. And uh, if you're dreaming, if you've got businesses, man, run them. Be successful, but channel them for the kingdom. You know, channel them for the kingdom. You, use it as your mission field. Reach people. At the end of the day, you get to, people will never remember 10 years, 100 years, how much money you made. It will mean nothing to anybody. But if you have a lasting impact, people will remember you forever. There was someone who spoke into that guy's life. You trans, you know, you changed everything. That's what we want. Um, maybe we'll close with that proverb. He said, a righteous man 
leaves an inheritance for his children's children. children. The best inheritance that you can leave your children is, is Jesus. My dad always sang that song. He said, I can, I can, I can wish you the greatest, the greatest of things. Peace, finance, um, riches, everything that you want, but I wish you Jesus. I would rather wish you Jesus, because if I wish you Jesus, I wish you everything. Come on. If, you, if you're young with your dad today, and they drag you to church, thank your mom and your dad for doing that. They pulled you by the ear and you threw a tantrum and you didn't want to wake up telling you, thank them, thank them. This stuff is the real stuff. Amen? Come on, let's, let, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your promise in Isaiah that says, even though darkness may cover the earth, even though depression may cover the earth, light will shine on your church and lord that we like what you prayed we do not belong to the world we're not of this world we're not of the system we're not uh, going to conform to the agenda of this world father i pray that your spirit will be poured out again that the spirit that we will that will be filled again and that maybe there's people here in this in the church that say i don't even know what that's like but that we'll all just be open to it, get hung, hungry again for Jesus. I pray for the young people in this place. Lord Jesus, that right now, even while we're praying, that you'll, you'll touch them with your presence, that you'll touch their hearts, that you'll wash them from all the things that they've been exposed to, all the nonsense this world is throwing at us, that we'll be washed clean, purified, that we can stand pure before you, free from the filth and the agenda that the world puts on us. I pray for the young people, Lord Jesus, that they'll be able to stand even when the, the onslaughts are coming at them, conf trying to conform, that there'll be people with the spirit of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that will oppose the current, the trend, and will stand for that which truly cannot be shaken. Holy Spirit, fill us again. Fill us again. Help us be passionate people, passionate about our faith. Oh, that, we, that we won't drift left or right, that we, will, that we will live our lives to the full, but full of the Holy Ghost, <laughs> full of the anointing. And so, Father, if these things that we read happened 2,000 years ago, and if you, your word promises that of the increase of your kingdom, there will be no end. Father, we know that there's, gonna, that there's an increase in this time. And we, we pray that even amidst the, the negative news, the agendas of, of the world, that the church will begin to break through. That there's going to be miracles and wonders happening again. That we maybe will read about some people who would not um, would not compromise, who will not compromise. And uh, yeah, that we're going to see the church shining as a place of refuge. People will come. People will come. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We thank you. So yeah, so I bless everybody with that word. And uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with His presence. In Jesus' name, amen.